The most viewed Pokemon tournament in the world is not the official VGC World Championships. It's actually not even close. The Poke Cup, as it's called, has become a sensation in the Spanish-speaking parts of the internet. This incredibly original Pokemon competition took root in Spain in 2021, and for its third edition, held in November and December of 2023, they pulled out all the stops, being hosted by none other than Ebay, the biggest streamer in the world. The Poke Cup is a competition held with 40 teams composed of streamers and experienced Pokemon players with two phases. The second phase is pretty simple. It's a Pokemon battling tournament, and for 2023, it would be played with VGC rules for the first time. Double battles. Bring a team of six Pokemon to the match and use four in each battle. All that good stuff. But it's the first phase that really separates Poke Cup from any other Pokemon competition I've ever seen. And it's what makes it the most interesting for my channel. The first phase is what determines what teams these players would be using in their battles. Their teams would have to be constructed from a box that survived a Nuzlocke playthrough. And this wasn't just any Nuzlocke. Delta. Delta. Today's video is sponsored by the spring cleaning champions over at Manscaped. It's springtime, it's time to clean up your face, and Manscaped has two products just for you to do that. The first one is the Beard Hedger Pro. This is a premium facial hair trimmer. My favorite feature is that it's got this zoom wheel to set exactly which length you want to trim your beard at. Just listen to how satisfying this sounds. Come on, any length between 0.5 millimeters and 10 millimeters you can achieve with this thing. It's got titanium coated stainless steel blades. The only thing is that it's a little big to travel with, but isn't it great that Manscaped has another solution for that? With the second product that this video is sponsored by, my personal favorite Manscaped product, and I've been working with them for years now, the Handyman. I just got back from a 10 day trip to the US and I was seeing a lot of people there going to meetings and going to events and I need to keep myself fresh and clean. And this thing is perfect for that. It doesn't have quite the amazing capabilities as the beard hedger of course but it's got a lot of power in there if you just want to keep yourself clean if you just want to trim that stubble just make it look nice and clean maintain it the handyman's perfect for that it's really small fits into every pocket charges via USB-C. you don't have to pack any additional cables or anything to charge it with there's no way you can accidentally turn on because the cover just slides over it's amazing. I love this thing so much and it's been on every single trip that I've been on ever since I got it. If you want to check out any of these two products, go to the link in the description or in the pinned comment. It's manscaped.com slash peachal, 20% off of either of these products or any other male grooming products that you want. Thank you so much to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Let's get back into it. The players find themselves in a fascinating near future world where the new social network Delta has an intriguing offer for them. Come live in this town of streamers away from all the regular people and riffraff. That's you, viewer. It seems like a great place to grow your brand, and they even have a house all ready for you. But everything in Delta Land is not as it seems. Everybody's acting all weird. Mmm, hola. Mmm, mmm, cowboy. One day, the player is taken from the capsule where all the streamers are living to Coach Headquarters, a group of people that is aware of Delta's nefarious plans to use the streamers for their own game. The player's goal is to save the streamers Delta has been manipulating and then take out the evil behind Delta. Listen, I'll spare you most of the plot details, but there's like a whole AI storyline and Mark Zuckerberg shows up. There's all this crazy detail art for the story characters, boss fights, and even some sick unique Pokemon sprites. Like, look at this beware. He's so chill. Gameplay wise though, this is still Pokemon. Badges are replaced with chips, and instead of taking on gym leaders, the player is taking on Delta's streamers in order to save them from the chips that are controlling them. It may have its own unique look, but it's still your typical eight badges into Elite Four structure that you're used to, that same Pokemon gameplay loop you know and love. Poke Cup teams are made up of the main player, a streamer who tends to be newer to Pokemon, and their partner, a coach who's very, very experienced. A great example was last year's champions. The streamer was Mixwell, who's best known for his illustrious professional Counter-Strike and Valorant career, and his coach was Poke Alex, one of Spain's best VGC players for nearly a decade and the winner of last year's North American International Championships. To make sure it's truly a team effort, the coach's input is limited. They can help all they want with wild Pokemon battles. What Juan? What are you Juan? Juan! and they can plan out the trainer battles with their players beforehand, but once the trainer battle starts, the streamer is on their own. No voice input from the coaches, and their streamers even have to have their chat in emote only mode. The thing is, the goal isn't just to complete the Nuzlocke. The goal is to beat the Nuzlocke with a box that can actually hang in the second phase of the competition. Only your surviving Pokemon can be used in the actual tournament. Maybe you're tempted to use the Salamence you caught to get through a difficult trainer battle, but think twice because you're probably going to want it around for phase two. 
Despite a few optimal Pokemon standing out from the crowd, the ROM hack the streamers played for the Nuzlocke phase had enough randomness to ensure everybody didn't just bring the same team to the tournament. Not only were encounters fully randomized, but so were each Pokemon's abilities and movesets. Pokemon like Primarina, Garchomp, Snorlax, Dragapult saw lots of usage in this tournament because, well, they're good Pokemon. Good stats, good typings, maybe even both. But the Pokemon caught in this Nuzlocke also had random moves and random abilities. And it turns out Primarina might not be as threatening without Liquid Voice to boost its Hyper Voices. Garchomp kinda needs Earthquake, and Dragapult's speed is a lot less scary without moves like Dragon Darts or Shadow Ball to back it up. And Snorlax is great until it runs into a Ghost type while only knowing normal and fighting type attacks. Even though a lot of Pokemon were repeated on the teams in this tournament, the trainers had to get creative with how they use them, because there is no standard sets here. Just the same though, an often forgotten Pokemon might just be one great move or one awesome ability away from becoming a superstar. As a result, some of the heroes of this tournament were a little unexpected, to say the least. Meet Sopita. When Felipez ran into this wild tranquil, he didn't think much of it. Nicknaming your Pokemon is one of the competition's rules, and he named it Sopita. Right away, Soup has a move that instantly makes her a potential member of Felipe's tournament squad, Fake Out. It's a move so potentially broken that Game Freak has limited it to just 33 fully evolved Pokemon. Pokemon like Raichu, Scrafty, Palmot, and Tokunamaru have managed to carve out niches because of it despite mediocre stat spreads. Others like Incineroar and Rillaboom go from merely great devils Pokemon without it to top tier threats with it. Fake Out is a pretty good move in single battles where it's nothing more than a turn of free chip damage, but in doubles it's one of the best moves in the game, allowing you to completely lock down one of your opponent's two Pokemon, leaving it as a sitting duck for your teammate. It shreds focus sashes, forces defensive plays like protecting or switching, and with its plus three priority, it's one of the strongest options to shut down fast opposing Pokemon in a metagame that relies on speed control through field conditions like Tailwind and Trick Room. Still, Sopita needs to be able to do something on the subsequent turns. She had fine normal type damage with Return, but nothing to take advantage of her flying type and the incredible ability she rolled, Gale Wings, which grants priority to flying type moves at full health. Level up moves are also random in this game, so Felipez would need some luck, but if he could just find a solid physical flying type attack, he'd be golden. By the time he'd reached the next gym battle, he hit the jackpot, Acrobatics. Not long after learning Acrobatics, Felipez ran into one of the craziest bosses of this game. That's a pretty big health bar. Let's just say he was glad to have a move with Acrobatics' oomph here. The fake out and acrobatics combination was enough to make Sopita a key member of Felipe's team throughout the rest of the Nuzlocke. It came to every battle and was the MVP of just about all of them. Felipe's run was really clean. From the time he picked up Sopita, he lost all of one Pokemon, his Clefairy. With the help of his coach, Bree, he made it through all of the gym battles and all of their gym challenges, startlingly well done minigames inspired by other games like F-Zero or Soccer. With all eight chips in hand, it was time to overthrow Delta and take down Mark Zuckerberg. I can't believe I'm reading this. After Sopita and his Galissapod combined to take down Zuck and his evil AI, Felipez had qualified for the second phase, and with a pretty healthy box. He also benefited from one of the quirky rules of this tournament. See this Munchlax? Holy fucking shit! It's kind of hard to tell, but this little guy's a shiny, and that means he's a free encounter for Felipez. And he's a great one. Snorlax is an annoying Pokemon to face in a double battle because even if both opponents attack him, chances are he's going to live. And then there's the random move. One of Snorlax's big weaknesses is usually its lack of healing moves like Recover or Soft Boiled, having instead to rely on something like the less consistent combination for Cycle plus a Berry. Well, this one has Roost. Don't ask me to explain the logistics of Snorlax making a nest, but with Curse to boost its attack and defense, Drain Punch for healing, and Facade to power through burns, this thing was a wall. Just don't ask it to hit any ghost types. Felipe went with two more VGC legends, Garchomp and Goldengo. Running on his team were Glaceon and Dusnor. Unfortunately for Felipez, he encountered Dusnor fully evolved. Dusclops has been a much more successful VGC Pokemon thanks to its access to insane levels of bulk through holding an Eviolite. But there was still a lot of cool synergy on this team. Snorlax and Glaceon bait fighting moves that Goldengo and Dusnor can switch into harmlessly. Sopita's fake out could enable slower threats like Snorlax and Goldengo to sweep, or let Garchomp get off Earthquakes without having to worry about an Ice-type threat on the other side of the field, or hitting its partner. And there's one other important aspect of those Ghost types on this team that will be quite apparent later. After finishing the Nuzlocke, the streamers had their chances to collaborate with their coaches and put any finishing touches on their teams, as some final moves and held items could really tie everything together. The battles in Phase 2 were mostly played under VGC standard rules, but there were a couple of wrinkles. First off, battles were best of 5 games, as opposed to the typical best of 3 you'll see at a regional or world championship. And in order to keep things spicy and prevent the same strategy from winning three games in a row, players were able to ban one Pokemon from their opponent's team from each game. Felipe's first opponent, DJ Mario, had some VGC greats in Togekiss, Dragapult, and Gyarados, but the scariest sweeper on his team turned out to be his bulk up Whiskash. Despite Felipe's jumping to a 2-0 lead, in large part thanks to the strength of his Gold Dingo and its Dazzling Gleams, 
DJ Mario was able to even things out, but in game 5, the hero turned out to be Felipe's Glaceon. Despite the fact that its wide lens was knocked off, it double hit not one, but three straight blizzards onto DJ Mario's boosted Whiskash. The last was a critical hit, dealing just enough damage to let Snorlax finish off a double KO. There's still two Pokemon left, and they're the two Pokemon that have been DJ Mario's anchor this whole set, Togekiss and Dragapult. This was far from over, but it turned out Felipe's Glaceon wasn't done being blessed by RNGesus. What about Sopita? The set wasn't her greatest showing, but the Poké Cup participants would soon learn why Felipe's showdown name was Get Sopita. His round opponent was Revan, who also had a team centered around Togekiss and a dragon, this time Dragonite. Game 1 started with each player trading off special attacks. Felipe's took down Togekiss and Revan took down Glaceon. On turn 3, everything was finally in position. Primarina had protected on turn 2, both Primarina and Ormaldo were slower, and it was time for Sopita to do her thing. El potote está bajado. Madre mía. Madre mía, Sopita. Que Sopita es mi man. Pero qué es esto. Ay, Sopita, ¿cómo hace? Sopita, loco. Vaya puto muñeco. Es que no puedo. <risa> imagínate, imagínate el coach de Reven viendo esto y diciendo: ¿Qué, qué acaba de pasar? Felipez was able to keep it going with Sopita on the bench thanks to a boosted Snorlax and the power of Goldango's ridiculously diverse move pool, with Scald, Shadow Ball, and Dazzling Gleam all putting in work. But she came back from game 3 and once again made her presence felt, this time showing it's not just the boom that makes her valuable. Revan had shut down acrobatics in game 1 with his Armaldo's dazzling ability, which prevents any priority attacks like Gale Wing's boosted acrobatics from going off. This time, Sopita was able to launch an acrobatics into Dragonite, and despite its strong defense, Dragonite dropped from nearly two thirds health. Explosion took down Togekiss, and although things got tense at the end, Dust North's Shadow Claws were strong enough to let it outlast Revan's Primarina and lock up the 3 0 victory. <laughs> Next up was Barbecue, another Dragonite trainer. This team had speed in Greninja, power from Amoswine, and defense in the form of Dusclops and Tinkaton. Both trainers traded lucky breaks in the first two games. Barbecue had a nice surprise on his Greninja to deal with Felipe's lead of Glaceon and Goldengo. Overheat, which would have been amazing if it had managed to hit either time, Barbecue clicked it. Felipe's ran away with that game as a result, but the tables turned in game two when Barb's Mamoswine hit a crit freeze to tie the set. Falla. Nah. Karma. Definitivamente karma. Felipez could prevent Barbecue's Dust Claps from setting Trick Room, but he was able to use it to his own advantage, getting Glaceon in to spam Wide Lance aided Blizzards and take a double KO. Despite staring down a Conk Holder in Trick Room, Felipez saw the opportunity to push his advantage. Even with Sucker Punch, Conkholder couldn't do enough by itself to make the comeback and Felipez was in position to advance to the semi-finals. Greninja came through for Barbecue in Game 4, revealing the insanely strong spread move Fiery Wrath, normally Moltres Galar's signature move, and landing a huge flinch on Felipez's Garchomp. Felipez managed to bring it back to a position where a crit or freeze from Glaceon's Blizzard could have won him the game, but it wasn't in the cards. Was his luck finally running out? It sure seemed like it early in Game 2 as Barbecue's Dusclops managed to land Will-O-Wisp burns onto both Sopita and Garchomp, but he found a huge opening on turn 6. With Conkholder threatening a huge sucker punch onto Goldengo, he read his opponent and switched out, opening the door for Sopita to take the kill with acrobatics before fainting to its burn damage. <coughs> Things still looked bad. Dusclops had reversed Trick Room and now Greninja was by far the fastest thing on the field, with both Overheat and Fiery Wrath to threaten Felipez. Estamos turbo jodidos. <coughs> How could he wiggle his way out of this one? Glaceon went down to the first overheat. No misses this time. But Dazzling Gleam barely missed the KO on Dusclops, and now it was surely over. Plot armor. Choice specs save the day for Felipez, preventing Barbecue from clicking the fiery wrath that certainly would have KO'd here. It's hard to fault Barbecue for thinking that Helping Hand Overheat could take down the Goldengo even after the special attack drop, but I bet he was kicking himself for not trying fiery wrath instead. Two Helping Hand Fiery Wraths certainly would have taken out both of Felipez's Pokemon. Glaceon's Thunder was scary if it lived the Fiery Wrath, but I have to imagine the combination of its power and the flinch chance gave Barb the best chance of winning in that position. With that, the man whose tournament plan relied on a bird named Soup was just one win away from the finals. What followed in the semifinals against iPand Arena would be Sopita's best performance yet. No sé cómo queda el el matchup entre ellos aquí. Así que vamos a ver. Pobre Poto. Y Sopum. Y so, boom. 
Y so boom! With a 3 on 2 advantage, not even the download boosted for Ninja or Calmine Tangeroth in the back could stop Filipes from taking the early lead. Wow! Vaya opción! Oh, limpio, coño, vale, 1-0. He jugado, he jugado, tío. Ahora tengo una cosa. Panarina tried a different lead in game 2, relying on a couple of slow but very physically imposing Pokemon in King Gambit and Ursa Luna. King Gambit's steel typing threatened to make it much more difficult for Filipes to find his opportunity to explode, but on turn 2, Ursa Luna protected in front of Sopita, and Filipes saw his chance. Igual saca el fantasma, también te digo. De la explosión. Panda, elige, porfa. <ríe> El timing. Oh. <ríe> no, el acróbata, loco. Saca más, saca más, saca más. me la suda, loco. Ancho, sea best. It was just a 2v2 this time, but Dustnar's U turn was the perfect answer to both the Greninja and Tangaroth on the other side. Down went Greninja, and that was that. Tangaroth simply couldn't do enough damage to turn the tides, and Philippus went up 2 0. Philippus would get another double KO with his explosion and scald combination on turn 2, and game 3 would be the easiest of the whole set. Thanks to a trio of huge booms, Philippus and Sopita had advanced to the finals. His opponent would be Susana, who'd been having quite the crazy run of her own. Her team had a few Pokemon we've seen before in Dragonite and Primarina, as well as Annihilate, Ferrothorn, Skeleturge, and Tyranitar. She was the one to take down reigning champion Mixwell in a ridiculous game 5 set, where she showed just how good water shuriken and its priority can be on the otherwise slow Primarina. Espera, que tiene que matar el Energy Ball. Puede salir de crítico. Es más rápido, Jimmy. Es más rápido, Jimmy. Jimmy. Amigos, Pero quién es Jimmy? Saca. ¿Quién es Jimmy? Against Skane in the semifinals, her team just had too many tanks. Her Ferrothorn alone was able to wall most of his threats. She would win three and one, setting up the matchup against Felipe's in the finals. This one looked rough for Sopita and the gang. Susana had two ghost types in Annihilate and Skeleturge, and two normal resists in Tyranitar and Ferrothorn. It was looking like Felipe's was going to have to win this one honestly, and that was not part of the plan. Game one showed just how well the pair of Ferrothorn and Tyranitar could deal with Sopita's nonsense. Knockoff from Tyranitar one-shot Goldengo and Annihilate's Thunder Punch nearly got Sopita. Felipe tried to get his Snorlax set up for a reverse sweep, but it was too little too late. The critical adaption for game two was Garchomp, who was a particularly scary matchup for pretty much all of Susana's Pokemon, even the Primarina that threatened it back with Moonblast. Garchomp ran wild, taking a double KO with the aid of some acrobatics chip on turn three, and it was simply too much momentum for her to overcome. Felipez was able to get huge momentum in Game 3 thanks to Gale Wing's priority, which allowed him to swing with acrobatics and deal huge damage to Annihilate before Dragonite was able to counterattack with the attack dropping Breaking Swipe. Snorlax was able to get out on the field and absolutely sit on the combination of Primarina and Skeleturge. Once Sopita was able to switch back in safely on turn 6, it was basically all over. Susana was done adapting though. Annihilate was able to deal much more damage before going down in Game 4, and a good protect call on Sopita's explosion let Susana get just enough momentum even though her Primarina went down. She Get on Tyranitar and Skeleturge being enough in the endgame, and she was right. Even through Curse, Tyranitar's knockoff did significant damage to Snorlax, and she was able to force a fifth and deciding game. It was Philippe's turn to adapt, and for the first time, he brought Glaceon. And it didn't even get to move, taken down by a combination of Annihilate's Drain Punch and Dragonite's Brave Bird. But Philippe's didn't give up. He found a huge opportunity on turn two, swords dancing with Garchomp in front of Dragonite's Protect, and taking out Annihilate with a critical hit, Shadow Ball. Suddenly, the tables were turned. Garchomp was extremely threatening with its plus two attack, and it managed to get the KO on Dragonite before dropping to Primarina's Moonblast. Fittingly, it was all going to come down to a 2v2. Felipe's Dusknor and Goldengo against Susana's Skeleturge and Primarina. Now, experience the final two turns of Poké Cup 3 the way they were meant to be experienced, from Spanish streamer's Evi's point of view, as he was screaming his lungs out in excitement as the tournament reached its conclusion. Pero se ha quitado la amenaza de Garchomp y ahora es sale. Es que barbaridad de final. Y es Night Lu, ahí lo tiene Shadow Ball, se lo ha leído, 90%. Flamethrower, tampoco mata. Night se ataca al Skeletor, se lo ha leído, lo protege. Lo va, lo va a ganar Felipe. Ahí está, correcto. Es más rápido, es más rápido. Lo va a rematar Night to. Una Paulo, una Paulo, una Paulo. Se lo lleva Felipe. Se lo lleva Felipe. A ver, Felipe, por hacer este video, Felipe. De los Acaba de ser campeón de la Pokémon Twitch Cup. La madre que me parió. Eliminando a Susana, Sin Barbe, Rebe. Qué barbaridad. Sin coach competitivo. Chico. ¿Qué ha hecho este tío? If you watch the tournament from Felipe's point of view, you'll see that he was self-deprecating for much of the tournament, lacking confidence in his strategic abilities as a Pokémon player. Entonces, en cuanto salga de la ruta 1, va a palmar Peña. Como si no hubiera un puto... Es que... 
Estamos jodidísimos, loco. Felipas went in planning just to lean on Sopita. And don't get me wrong, this trash bird put in some incredible work in this tournament. But it says something that Felipas won the deciding game 5 despite leaving her on the bench. Maybe he really did go in with no plan, and maybe his team didn't make any sense. But it seems to me that if Poke Cup is about anything, it's about taking the chaos it presents you and rolling with the punches. This time around, nobody did that better than Felipas. And I think the English-speaking Nuzlocke and competitive Pokemon community have a lot to learn from the Spanish-speaking one.